In this video, we're going to learn to take some derivatives of the inverse trig functions, and then that will allow us to evaluate some new types of integrals. So let's start by calculating the derivative of inverse sine of x. So I'll rewrite y equals inverse sine of x as x equals sine of y. And so let me draw a triangle here. So y is the angle. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. And I can fill in the missing side from the Pythagorean theorem. And now what I'll do is I'll differentiate both sides of this equation, x equals sine of y. Now on the left side, it's straightforward differentiation, but on the right-hand side, I'm going to have to use implicit differentiation. So on the left-hand side, the derivative of x with respect to x is just 1, and the derivative of sine of y with respect to x would be the derivative of the outside, which would be cosine of y, times the derivative of the inside, which will be dy dx. And I can solve for dy dx. And now this is where the uh, triangle is useful. Because now I can go back to the triangle and say, well, what is an expression for cosine of y in terms of x? That is what I'd like. I'd like to be able to calculate my derivative dy dx as a function of x. Well. From the triangle, I can see that the cosine of the angle y would be adjacent over hypotenuse, but the hypotenuse is just 1, so the cosine of y would be radical 1 minus x squared. So the derivative of inverse sine of x is 1 over radical 1 minus x squared. And that tells me that the antiderivative of 1 over radical 1 minus x squared is the inverse sine or the arc sine plus some constant. We can use the same technique with all of our trig functions. So let's go ahead and do uh, inverse cosine. Same way. I'm going to start by writing it as x equals cosine of y. I'll go ahead and draw a triangle. And I'll need to fill in that third side. So the missing side would be radical 1 minus x squared, again, using the Pythagorean theorem. Now I'll differentiate both sides implicitly. Derivative of cosine y would be negative sine y times dy dx. And so dy dx is just going to be negative 1 over sine of y. So again, I want my derivative in terms of x. And so I'm going to go back to the triangle and find an expression for sine of y. So sine of y is uh, opposite over hypotenuse. And so that would give me uh, radical 1 minus x squared. So the derivative of inverse cosine looks almost identical to the derivative of inverse sine, except for a negative sign in front of it. All right, what about inverse tangent? Well, again, we'll write that as x equals tangent y. Draw a triangle. y will be my angle. Tangent is opposite over adjacent, so that'll be x on the opposite side and 1 on the adjacent side. And from the Pythagorean theorem, then, I know that the hypotenuse can be written as radical 1 plus x squared. Now we'll differentiate implicitly. The derivative of tangent of y will be secant squared y times dy dx, or dy dx is going to be 1 over secant squared 
y. So from my triangle, remembering that secant is 1 over cosine, and so that'll be hypotenuse over adjacent. So it'll just be radical 1 plus x squared. And so our derivative of the arctan function of x is just 1 plus 1 over x squared. And the antiderivative then of dx over 1 plus x squared will be arctan of x plus c. So there's a clear pattern here, but let's just do one more. Let's figure out the uh, derivative of inverse secant. I think it's worth learning this pattern because this pattern is so useful. Uh, and we're going to actually develop this as a method for integration. So we're going to take uh, x equal to secant y. That's the equivalent equation for y equals inverse secant of x. We'll draw, we will draw our triangle. So again, what is secant? Secant is going to be hypotenuse over adjacent. So x then over 1, x on the hypotenuse, 1 is the adjacent side. Use the Pythagorean theorem to come up with an expression. So now we have radical x squared minus 1. And differentiate implicitly both sides of x equals secant y. So I'll get 1 equals secant y tangent y times dy dx, or dy dx is 1 over secant y tangent of y. Well, I guess I don't really need the triangle to figure out what uh, secant of y is. x equals secant of y. That's how we got the triangle in the first place. But tangent of y is going to be opposite over adjacent, or radical x squared minus 1. So then making the substitution in our formula for dy dx, we get that the derivative of inverse secant is 1 over x times radical x squared minus 1. And that will tell me that the antiderivative of dx over x radical x squared minus 1 is going to be arc secant of x or inverse secant of x plus c. Now we actually did this or used this technique except for the triangle part. In general when we learned about the derivatives of inverse functions we found that if we have a one-to-one -one differentiable function where f prime of b is not equal to zero, then if f of b equals a, then f inverse prime at a equals one over f prime at b. Well, what we've been doing is we show that the derivative with respect of f inverse of x is one over the derivative with respect to y of f of y. Now we've been using trig functions and we've been using this right triangle to help us uh, really make use of the following identities, which all come from the Pythagorean theorem. Anyway, that cosine squared y plus sine squared y equals one. If I divide that equation, every term gets divided by cosine squared of y, I get 1 plus tangent squared y equals secant squared y. If I go back to the first equation and divide every term by sine squared y, I'm going to get cotangent squared y plus 1 equals cosecant squared y. So for example, another way that I could have got the formula for the derivative of y equals inverse sine of x would be to apply this theorem using this formula, which will give me 1 over cosine y, which I got using the other method. 
through implicit differentiation. And instead of using a triangle, I could have just used this identity and found that to be uh, one over radical one minus sine squared y, but x equals sine of y. So that's going to give me one over radical one minus x squared. So let's go ahead and use this technique to find the derivative of inverse cotangent of x. So I'll just take one over d dy of cotangent of y. Now the derivative of cotangent of y is negative cosecant squared of y. I'll put the negative sign on the y in the numerator. Then with cosecant squared of y, I will go ahead and use one of my trig identities to write that as one plus cotangent squared of y. And cotangent of y is x. So that will be negative one over one plus x squared. And finally, for inverse cosecant of x, I'll do the same steps. The derivative of cosecant of y with respect to y is going to be negative cosecant y cotangent y. I'll put the negative sign in the numerator again. Cosecant of y is just x. To find an expression for cotangent of y, I'll just use this identity to get negative 1 over x radical x squared minus 1. So let's take a look at these formulas. It's certainly worth remembering all of these three formulas here. But really, these are the only three you need to make sure you commit to memory. Make sure you memorize. Why? Because the derivative of the corresponding inverse cofunction, so inverse cosine, inverse cotangent, and inverse cosecant, just changes the sign. You just go from 1 over radical 1 minus x squared to negative 1 over radical 1 minus x squared. So the only difference between the derivative of inverse tangent and inverse cotangent is the inverse co-function has a negative 1. The inverse tangent function has a positive 1. And now if I have these formulas memorized these three formulas for the inverse sine of x, inverse tangent of x, and inverse secant of x, then I also know the formulas for these antiderivatives as well. So let's look at some examples. I'd like to find the values of x where the slope of the tangent line to y equals arc sine of radical x equals 1. So let's be clear here, right? That um, the input to arc sine is a number between negative 1 and positive 1. And the uh, output has to be an angle between uh, negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So let's go ahead and take the derivative here. When I use the take the derivative, I'm going to have to use my formula and then apply the chain rule. So remember the formula for the derivative of the inverse sine of u would be 1 over radical 1 minus u squared, and then apply the chain rule. So times the derivative of the inside. So the inside here is radical x. So when I square radical x, I'll just get x. The derivative of uh, radical x is 1 over 2 radical x. And so I want this derivative, which will be the slope of the tangent line. Uh, I want that to equal 1. So set that equal to 1. And let's go ahead and solve this equation. Um, 
I will go ahead and first just multiply both sides by 2 radical x, radical 1 minus x. And then from there, I'm going to go ahead and uh, divide both sides by 2 and um, multiply out on the inside to get x minus x squared under the radical sign. There's other ways you could go about solving this. So you don't have to follow these steps exactly. This is just an example. So the next thing I would do is go ahead and square both sides. And I'd like to make one side equal to 0. I'd like to see if I could factor this. And so thinking in terms of fractions with factoring can be challenging. So I'm going to multiply through by 4. And then I see 4x squared minus 4x plus 1 can be factored. It's actually 2x minus 1 in parentheses squared. And so that means that 2x minus 1 has to equal 0 or x equals 1 half. So let's just go back and do a little sanity check. If I uh, take radical 1 half, that's going to be a number between uh, negative 1 and positive 1. So that's a valid input to the arc sine function. Now here we're asked to find the critical numbers of arctan of 2 sine of x minus x. Now the input to the arctan, the domain of the arctan function is all real numbers, so we don't have to be concerned about that. So let's go ahead and find where, remember, critical numbers are values of x where the derivative, excuse me, values of x in the domain of f of x uh, where the derivative is either 0 or the derivative is not defined. So if I were to uh, take the derivative, first use the formula, so it's 1 over 1 plus input squared, then apply the chain rule, take the derivative of the inside. Now, one thing we can see is that in the denominator, I have 1 plus some number squared. Well, whenever you square a number, the smallest thing you can get is 0. So the denominator is never 0. So I don't have to worry about any critical numbers where the derivative would be undefined. The only critical numbers which would concern me would be where the derivative equals 0. And the only way that this fraction here can equal 0 is if the numerator equals 0. So I need to solve 2 cosine of x equals 1. So cosine of x equals 1 half. And remember, you know, x now can assume any value. So I would get x equals pi over 3 plus 2 pi k, or negative pi over 3 plus 2 pi k. All of the values in the unit circle were cosine of x equals uh, 1 half, and then add the 2 pi times an integer k, because cosine is periodic. Let's look at a, an integral now. I'd like to evaluate the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of sine of x over 1 plus cosine squared of x. So what this reminds me of, whenever I see 1 plus cosine squared of x or 1 plus anything squared in the denominator, I should be thinking about the arc tangent. It may or may not work out, but it's one of the things I should try. And in fact, in this case, if I make the substitution u equals cosine x, so now I have 1 plus u squared in the denominator. And then du would be negative sine of x dx. So I have sine of x dx in the numerator. Let me go ahead. This looks like it's going to work out. So I'll go ahead and change the bounds when x equals 0 cosine of 0 equals 1, so u equals 1. When x equals pi over 2, 
cosine of pi over two is zero. So I'll have u equal to zero. So my integral in terms of u will have this negative sign that comes from the negative sign of x dx. Bounds go from one to zero and have du over one plus u squared, which we definitely recognize as the derivative of arctan of u. So I still have the minus sign there and I'll need to evaluate that between zero and one. So arctan of zero means the angle between negative pi over two and pi over two whose tangent equals zero. And that's just gonna be zero. Arctan of one means the angle between negative pi over two and pi over two whose tangent equals to one. And that's pi over four. So I'll have negative zero, which is just zero, plus pi over four, which gives me pi over four. Let's look at another integral here. Here I have e to the two x over radical one minus e to the four x. So first of all, I should note that e to the four x is what, what I get from taking e to the 2x and squaring it. So the denominator looks like radical 1 minus u squared, where u equals e to the 2x. So let's go ahead and try that u substitution. u equals e to the 2x. So then u squared would be e to the 4x and du would be 2e to the 2x dx. So this is an indefinite integral so there's no bounds. So I can write that in terms of my change of variables. That would give me one half out in front. That one half comes from this factor of two in front of du. Then I'll have the integral of du over radical one minus u squared, which I recognize to be arc sine of u. So my most general antiderivative would be one half arc sine of u plus c, but I can't leave it in terms of u. I want to go back and write this in terms of x. So that would be one half arc sine of e to the power of 2x plus c. Well, here's a third example. This looks so close to being arc secant, but our formula for arc secant does not have x squared minus 4. It has x squared minus 1. So I need to make some kind of u substitution uh, but it should be fairly simple to see what it is, though. I'd like to have a minus one here. One way I could get a minus one would be under the radical sign, I'm going to factor out four from both terms. So now my last term on, is going to be minus one, but now I have x squared over four as the first term. Now I could take the radical of four times the radical of the quantity x squared over four minus one. That would give me a two x, but I'll bring that out in front as a one half x. Um, maybe it would have made more sense to leave that as x over two uh, out in front. But let's continue with what I wrote. And then I'm going to rewrite x squared over 4 as the quantity x over 2 all squared. So now I have something squared minus 1. So if I'm still thinking about arc secant, let me let u equal x over 2. Then du would be 1 half dx. All right, well, that works out 
for putting this one half here, one half dx would just be uh, du. And then x equals 2u. All right, so that's a pretty simple substitution to make there. So writing this in terms of u, I would have one half. Now, why did this one half? Why didn't that go away? Um, because uh, dx is 2du, but x is 2u, so that one half has to stay there. And then radical u squared minus 1. So the 2s will divide out. And so what's left over is just going to have a uh, the du over radical, I'm sorry, du over u times radical u squared minus 1, which whose antiderivative is arc secant of u. So I'll have one half arc secant of u plus c, but I don't leave it in terms of u. I'll write that as arc secant of x over 2 plus c. Here's a different example. I'd like to be able to find the uh, value of the definite integral from 0 to 1 of arc sine of x dx. Now, we could do this analytically, to, so making a change of variables, but we need to learn some more techniques of integration. So I hope that when we learn integration by parts, we come back to this problem and see how we could use that technique called integration by parts. But what we're going to do is interpret this integral as an area. Well, here is our y equals arc sine of x. So remember this arc sine of x, really what this part is here, uh, well, this integral represents this shaded area going from 0 to 1. But if I think back to the graph of sine of x, that's going to be the same. Now here, uh, x goes between 0 and 1, so I want y to go from 0 to 1. y goes between 0 and pi over 2, so here my x value should go from 0 to pi, pi over 2. Here the right boundary line is x equals 1, so here my upper boundary line should be y equals 1. So the area of this shaded part is exactly the same as the area of this shaded part, where this magenta curve is y equals sine of x. So I can write that area as an integral using sine of x. That's going to be the top curve, y equals 1, minus the bottom curve, sine of x, between 0 and pi over 2. If I go ahead and find that antiderivative and evaluate it, I'll get pi over 2 minus 1. Quick check, pi over 2 is bigger than 1. I, this area and this area, uh, the integral representing that uh, would be a positive number. So our value pi over 2 minus 1 makes sense. In our last example, we're given a fairly complicated identity. And we don't have to use calculus to prove this identity. But uh, I think that the, this calculus technique is really useful. So we have 2 times arctangent of radical x minus arc sine of x minus 1 over x plus 1 equaling pi over 2. We'd like to show that that's true for all values of x. So our strategy in calculus has two parts. Well, first thing we're going to do is we're going to show that this function, the left-hand side of this identity, is a constant function. In other words, it has the same value no matter what x is, the same output value, no matter what the input x value is. And the way we're going to do that is to show that its derivative is 0 for all 
x. Remember, if you have any function and its derivative is 0 for all x, it must be a constant function. All right, and then the other th thing that we need to show is that, sure, this f of x is a constant. What constant value is that? So what I do is I pick a any value of x, because it, all, all values of x will give me the same output. Pick a value of x where it will be very easy to evaluate this expression. And I'm going to choose 0. If, I'm going to show that f of 0 equals pi over 2 as the second step in our strategy. So let's start by taking the derivative then. So the derivative of the first term, I have the 2 here. We saw this derivative in one of our previous examples or something similar. Maybe it was arc sine. But we're going to take 1 over the radical x squared. That's the derivative of the outside. And then apply the chain rule. That'll be the derivative of the inside, which is radical x. And then I'll need to do the same thing with my second term. The derivative of arc sine would be 1 over radical 1 minus that rational expression squared times the derivative of the rational expression x minus 1 over x plus 1. So let's go through this one step at a time. Uh, back to the first term. The derivative of radical x is 1 over 2 radical x. Radical x squared will just give me x. To simplify in the second term, under the radical sign, I'm going to write that as a single fraction with a common denominator of x plus 1 squared. So I'll have x plus 1 squared. 1 is the same as x plus 1 squared over itself. So now under the radical sign in the numerator, I have x plus 1 squared minus the quantity x minus 1 squared. And then applying the chain rule, I'm going to use the quotient rule. The derivative of the top is 1 times the bottom. Subtract off the derivative of the bottom, which is also 1, times the top all over the bottom squared. So let's do some algebra to simplify both of those expressions. So the 2's will divide out in the first term. So I'm left with 1 over radical x, parentheses, x plus 1. Over here, when I multiply this out, uh, I'll get an x squared, then minus an x squared. I'll get a plus 2x minus a minus 2x, so that'll give me 4x, and then 1 minus 1, which will give me 0. So now I'll have 1 over radical 4x over radical x plus 1 squared, and that's just going to give me x plus 1. And then I'll multiply that by, well, let's simplify this. I'll have an x minus x, then a 1 minus a negative 1. So I'll have 2 on top and x plus 1 squared on the bottom. Now, 1 over a fraction is its reciprocal. So the first term, I, I can't do any further simplification, but I can write in the second term, I can write 1 over the fraction radical 4x over x plus 1 as its reciprocal x plus 1 over 2 radical x. And then that gets multiplied times the second factor, 2 over x plus 1 squared. So I see I have x plus 1 as a common factor. 2 is also a common factor. So after I simplify that, the numerator will just be 1. And what's left over in the denominator is radical x times x plus 1. So I have 1 over radical x parentheses x plus 1. Subtract the same thing, which will give me 0. So since f prime of x is identically 0, remember when you use three lines for the equal sign, that implies that identically 0, meaning 0 for all values of x. Then we can say that our 
function, which was the left-hand side of the identity, is a constant function. And now let's go to the second part. f of 0 would be, well, twice arctan of 0, which will just be 0, minus arc sine of negative 1. So what angle between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 has sine of negative 1? That would be negative pi over 2. So minus or minus gives me pi over 2. So now we have established the identity. So f of x equals pi over 2 for all x. And so now we've shown that the left-hand side equals the right-hand side.